Hello, this is lecture three from chapter two, talking about macroeconomic data. And in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about investments. We'll talk a little bit about what it is, and then we'll talk about some of the determination of an investment. So definition, this is spending on goods bought for future use, a capital goods. This includes things like um, business fixed investment, so spending on plant and equipment, things like if um, 3M decides to build a new factory, that purchase of the stuff to make the factory and the making of the factory, that's investment. Um, residential fixed investment, this is kind of a special case we talk about people buying homes. All right. So even if you buy a home and you live in your own home, we think of you as a renter renting to you know a landlord renting to yourself. And inventory investment. So this is businesses produce stuff, but they don't sell it. So they are investing in their inventory, right? So that they will sell it eventually. So if I buy, say, a um, hundred dollars worth of goods for my store, I don't instantaneously sell it while I buy it and put it on the shelf, that's called inventory investment. Okay, so before I go on, I want to give this basic definition that's not quite right, but works really well for investment, is essentially business is buying stuff in order to make stuff. All right, so businesses buy stuff like tools and factories and, and, and things like that in order to make other stuff. And that really works quite well for this business fixed investment. When we talk about residential fixed investment, it's a little bit different because we're buying houses in order to produce housing, but still it's a business buying something. So all right, some firm, it could even be a private individual who's just buying their own home, but they're buying it to do what? Provide themselves with housing. Or if you're a landlord and you rent the home, you're providing housing to someone else. And then finally, inventory investment. Well, that's that's essentially we think of that as kind of an accounting trick to take care of. Well, what happens if I produce something in 2013 but don't sell it until 2014? How do I keep track of all that? Well, I keep track of that through this inventory investment account. Okay, so that's investment. Now we need to cover the idea of well, how do we determine investment? And so if we think about it, businesses and people in general are going to do this kind of cost-benefit analysis. They're going to count the costs. So how much does it cost me to um, buy this capital, right, which the purchase of capital is what we will call investment for the rest of the class. Okay. Um, and what's the benefit of buying this capital? And if the benefit outweighs the cost, I buy it. If the cost outweighs the benefit, I don't. It's pretty much that simple what we're going to do as far as modeling how firms determine whether to buy capital, how much capital to buy. So we want to think about, well, how much does capital cost? Well, the first part of capital is going to be the interest cost. So in in essence, you know, what would I give up? You know, how much would I have to give up in order to, you know, other opportunities in order to take on this opportunity? All right, so we have this interest cost. And when we look at interest cost, we're going to look at the nominal price of the capital times whatever our interest rate is. Two, we have a depreciation cost. So if I buy this capital, I'm going to use it up. All right, so if let's say I am a um, trucking company and I buy a truck. Well, every mile that truck drives is one mile less that truck has to drive in its total lifetime, right? It wears out over, capital wears out over time. And so we have some kind of an expense that we want to use to determine, well, how much of this capital do we use up um, every period? And we call that depreciation costs. Now, this little squiggly guy here, okay, this little squiggly guy, that's a script delta. And we're going to use throughout the class this script delta. And in case you want to know how to write it, the easiest way to do it is just like that, just a squiggle with a loop at the end. We're going to use that to represent the depreciation rate. All right, What percentage of capital gets used up every period? Well, if we buy nominal um, amounts of capital of PK, that's one unit of capital, um, as a nominal price of PK, how much is it going to cost us in terms of depreciation every period? Well, for each unit of capital, it's going to cost us this delta times P. 
DPK. That's our depreciation cost. Next, we have capital loss. Okay, this capital loss or gain is determined by the capital market. Does the price of capital go up or down? So if I buy a cool who's a mawaja to widget, all right, that everybody just has to have because it increases production by a bajillion percent and the price goes up, then I get a capital gain. If it turns out that that hujaba dajaba widget kind of, well, doesn't work so well, maybe the price goes down, I have a capital loss. All right? So this is just basically saying, okay, at the end of the period, what happened to the market for this particular piece of capital? So if we look at this overall, the nominal cost of capital is our interest expense plus our depreciation expense minus our capital loss. And of course, if we had a capital gain, that would increase our um, or decrease our cost. So if uh, delta PK is positive, we have a lower cost. And if it's negative, then we'd have a higher cost. That's why there's a negative in front of the delta PK. And if we factor the whole PK out, we end up with this nominal price level times, or the nominal price of capital times the interest rate plus depreciation rate minus the growth rate or the rate of return on capital, this growth rate in the price level of capital or the price of capital. Okay, so leave that right there. I know that looks big and nasty and ugly, but just give us a half a second and we'll make it better. Okay, so we want to figure out, we figured out that big nasty equation for the nominal cost of capital, but let's, let's start simplifying things a little bit, and we're going to make the simplifying assumption that the growth rate in the price level for capital, or the price of capital, equals the inflation rate. Now notice I've got this Greek letter pi right here. All right, what in the world is that stupid Greek letter pi doing there? I mean, you know, doesn't that equal 3.14? Well, for the purposes of this class and throughout this class, pi does not equal 3.14. Okay, I, I know I grant you I love the number pi. It's one of my favorite numbers, um, mostly because it tastes good. And March 14th, great day, pi day. You get to eat pi all day. It's great. But pi does not equal for this class 3.14. Pi equals the inflation rate, or the change in price over price. So the change in price level over price level, it's the growth rate of the price level. It's the inflation rate. That's what pi stands for and will stand for throughout the class. Okay, so we're going to say that um, the growth rate in the price of capital equals the inflation rate. Well, in that case, we can rewrite that big nasty equation that we end up with at the end that looks like this. All right, just just substituting in pi for the change in um, price of capital over the price of capital, and then we can make one more simplifying uh, move to get to this. Now, what in the world's going on here? How do I go from this guy that has three things in the parentheses to this guy that only has two things in the parentheses? Well, it's simple. This R, what does that stand for? That's the real interest rate. And we'll talk about this more later, but there's this cool thing called the Fisher equation, which gives us an equation for the real interest rate. And it says that the real interest rate is approximately equal to the nominal interest rate, which is I, minus inflation. All right, so the real interest rate is approximately equal to the nominal interest rate minus inflation. And so we use this equation in here to get this. And so we see our cost of capital is the price of capital times the real interest rate plus the depreciation rate. Okay, so what do we see about that? We know that if the real interest rate goes up, what's going to happen to our cost of capital? It's going to go up. If the depreciation rate goes up, what's going to happen to our cost of capital? It's going to go up. Okay. If the nominal price of capital goes up, well, then the nominal cost of capital obviously goes up. And finally, if we divide through by price level, we end up with the real 
cost of capital being this guy. All right, the price of capital divided by P times the real interest rate plus the depreciation rate. So now we can say a few things. What happens if price level goes up? We have an increase in inflation. Well, that means P goes up, which will cause P over, PK over P to go up, or, or to go down, right, because P is in the denominator. And so that, cost, that real cost of capital goes down. If R goes up, that real cost of capital does what? It goes up. If delta goes up, what happens? That real cost of capital goes up. So the real cost of capital depends positively on relative price of capital. What does that mean? That means price of capital divided by the overall price level, the real interest rate, and the depreciation rate. Okay, Easy peasy. No problem so far, right? Now, if you don't remember how to get to here and on all that stupid derivation, you can always rewatch the video. Or just remember this. This is the key result that you need to remember. And really, the key result are these. That if the relative price of capital goes up, what's going to happen? Cost of capital goes up. If the real interest rate goes up, what's going to happen? Cost of capital goes up. Depreciation rate goes up, what's going to happen? Cost of capital goes up. Okay, so now that we know what the cost of investment is, let's take a look at this investment function. Well, if we, we write down here, first of all, the cost of investment, what is that? That's going to be the um, price of investment divided by the price level times the real interest rate plus the depreciation rate. Okay, and so we know that the cost of investment, so this is cost, is positively related to this price ratio, positively related to the real interest rate, positively related to the depreciation rate. So if we plot out what the investment function looks like, and essentially what we're going to do is we're going to plot it like this. All right, we'll put investment along the horizontal axis, and we're going to put the real interest rate along the vertical axis, and we find that we have investment is a function of, well, the relative price of investment, the real interest rate, and the depreciation rate. And, well, the cost is positively related to each one of these, and so investment should be negatively related to each one of these, because if it costs more, you'll want to, on a uh, ceteris paribus, want to do less investment. So if the interest rate goes up, investment wants to go down. And so there's a negative relationship between investment and the interest rate. More than that, we can look at and say, well, what would happen if the depreciation rate increased? Well, let's say we have an increase in depreciation, and we know that Depreciation makes the cost of investment go up, and if the cost of investment goes up, I want less investment. So, but wait a minute, depreciation isn't graphed anywhere on our graph, so that must be a shifting factor. And so what would happen? That would cause investment to shift to the left. What would happen if depreciation went down? Well, the opposite. Investment would shift to the right. Okay. Now, again, just like before when we talked about the consumption, um, all, all the stuff with the intertemporal um, consumption or intertemporal choice model for consumption, we figured out that, well, if I draw it out and then write out all, this, all these stupid formulas that I tell you, then it just tells me the answer. And we have the same thing here. We know that if we write the investment function down, from the cost function, it has to be negatively related to interest rates. And I know from the cost function, it's negatively related to depreciation rate, negatively related to the um, relative price of capital, I can see how it will plot and how it will shift. And that's our coverage of investments.